Okay, so again, I want to say a few more words about this riddle, so I remind you, uh, you put two to the n uh, balls uh, on the plus minus one to the n uh, square, uh, sorry, cube, and that, so, and you make them orange, and that's, of course, very important, and then they bound a blue ball in the middle, and the question is, uh, compute the limit as n goes to infinity, n being the dimension, of uh, the volume of the blue ball in the middle, divided by, so then you bound everything in a box, or a cube, divided by the volume of Cn. Okay? So, uh, seeing that I'm not very smart, uh, I delegated this to my computer, and I want to show you uh, what the computer says about the matter. So, first of all, uh, here is... Um, uh, I'll just draw the, 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 the two uh, images back again. So, these, these are the lines of codes that draw the images. And um, uh, so, basically, I put a, for the first one, I put a disk at all the tuples of length 2, centered at all the tuples of length 2, of 1s and minus 1s. That's exactly the, the, the points of the cube. So you get this, and then another disk at 0, 0, whose radius, right, another disk here at 0, 0, whose radius is, well, the distance from the center to the center, which is square root of 2, right, because of Pythagoras' uh, theorem, uh, and you get this picture. In three dimensions, it's similar, except the disk in the middle, uh, the ball in the middle, I guess it's now a bit hidden, so uh, if I will... Where's the mouse? Oh, here. Uh, wait, I lost the mouse. I, you know, I have so many screens that sometimes the mouse gets, gets lost. Oh, here it is, right. So, um... Right, so... So, so now the radius here is, you know, three coordinates go from 0 to 1, so the distance to the center of, the, of an orange ball is square root of 3, but then you subtract the radius of the orange ball, which is 1, so the radius of the uh, uh, blue ball is square root of 3, so that's what I'm drawing, and, okay, so at least now the problem is clear, okay? Now, uh, again, since I'm not very smart, I get my computer to, uh, to even figure out what is the volume of an n-dimensional uh, ball. So you just type in what is the volume of an n-dimensional ball, and, um, uh, and Mathematica gives you a formula. So it's 2 pi to the n over 2 times r to the n divided by blah blah blah. So I copy the formula to here, but insert it for the radius, uh, square root of n minus 1. And that, and, and sorry, n divided by 4 to the n, which is clearly the volume of the box. The box has um, uh, um, side 4, because it goes from minus 2 to 2, so divided by the volume of the box, which is 4 to the n, and I define the ratio as a function of n to be this thing. And then, uh, again, since I'm not very smart, I have the computer list the, I make a table of R of n, the ratio of function of n, where n goes from 1 to 100. Because, you know, dimension 100 is so high that it's absolutely safe. So here it is, here is the list. And we start from uh, 0.033 and slowly decline to 0.00039 and it's completely obvious that the limit is going to be zero, right? But of course, I wouldn't be asking you if the limit was zero. So let me extend this uh, table to 1200 and also plot it. So I'll get a plot of the ratio as a function of n 
where n goes from 1 to 1200. And, well, there are a few error messages because some of the numbers are too small or too large for the machine to handle. Uh, but basically, here is the answer. You start at about 0.3, you go to near zero, you stay flat near zero until maybe 600, then you start rising again, 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 and rise, and it looks, oops, it looks weird. So, in fact, let me compute uh, R of um, 1205. So, R of 1205 is, oh, damn. Sorry, uh, I should have made it 1205 with a decimal because uh, otherwise, well, I mean, the numbers are, are basically I want approximate numbers and instead of precise numbers because the numbers are too, uh, too small. Anyway, it's 0.93, so the ratio becomes near 1. And then look at the, let's look at the ratio of two, at 1206 and it's bigger than 1, and uh, in fact, if we tabulate the ratios as a function of uh, n, when n goes from 1 to 2,000, but, and then not even plot the numbers, but their logarithms, so this is a logarithmic plot, uh, then uh, here's what we get. So, the logarithm becomes really, really small, minus 10, which means the ratio is going nearly to zero, then starts climbing, well, maybe even before 600, maybe around 400. It starts climbing again, and at 2000, the, the logarithm is already 15, which means that the inside ball is way, 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 way bigger than the box that bounds it. And that sounds like a contradiction, but it isn't a contradiction. It only sounds like a contradiction because uh, the first two cases are misleading. Because what actually happens, as I said, uh, the radius of the inner ball is square root of n minus 1. Square root of n minus 1 goes to infinity. So what really happens is that somehow in high dimensions these orange balls become kind of small and in the corners and the ball in the middle gets bigger and bigger and bigger because, because I mean, these balls, well, their centers differ from 0, 0, 0 in all n coordinates. So they actually get very, very far from 0. And in fact, uh, at dimension 9, so if you look at dimension 9, uh, then uh, the radius of the inner ball, so at uh, uh, n equals 9, the radius of the inner ball is square root of 9 minus 1, which is 2. So that's where the box, the ball is tangent to the box. And after 9, it starts coming out, and eventually more and more and more of it is out until its volume overtakes the volume of the box. Uh, I don't know, if you think it's weird, I think it's weird too, but that's why I asked. Right? Okay. And it's also kind of weird that uh, you end up seeing this only at a very, very high dimension. Well, okay. Math is weird. Uh, okay, but our real topic for today was uh, the fundamental group. So I want to remind you uh, what we know about or what we've done on the fundamental group. So, uh, sorry, I want to uh, copy this uh, picture uh, to uh, let's say here. Oops, what happened? Oh no. Sorry, I, um, I'll never fully resolve my technical issues. 
Okay, so I want to copy. Oh, so you didn't switch your camera. What? Oh, I didn't. You didn't switch your. Oh, okay, sorry. That's a good time to switch my camera. Okay, uh, but now I want to. Uh, So, uh, we basically have an algorithm how to compute uh, the fundamental group of any knot. And uh, the homework assignment is in fact to prove the algorithm. But the algorithm goes as follows. First of all, you orient the knot. That's actually not important, but it makes it easier to I don't know, to keep conventions straight. And then you, underneath every arc of the knot, you put a little arc which really represents a generator. And this is the generator in which, um, uh, well, the base point is the camera. And the generator is a straight line to the tail of the arrow then follow the arrow under the arc and then back and then from the head of the arrow back to the camera so this is the generator a similarly for this arc so by convention i'll always cross my um, uh, things from left to right my my strands from left to right so uh, the next uh, arc well, this arc goes from here to here, the next arc starts here, so uh, uh, this will be the generator B. The next arc is this one, and the corresponding generator will be C. And the last arc is this one, and it goes that way, so the corresponding generator will be uh, D, this way. And then we get relations. So we get a relation for each crossing. And the relations come from uh, writing a little, um, um, what do I want it to be, clockwise or counterclockwise? I'm not sure. Uh, let's make it, uh, so basically the relations say that going under this way is the same as going under uh, 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 one, two, three times. Sorry, one, two, and three is this one. Okay? So, uh, in, in, in the case of the crossing I already wrote, the relation says that, I mean, going this way is B, and B is equal to going that way, which is uh, A inverse, and then going that way, which is, and then going the second green arrow, which is C, and then, uh, a, and then going down, which is the same as following A. So the relation is uh, B is equal to C conjugated by A. And then similarly, you have a relation for each crossing. For, so, for example, for uh, uh, the, this, the, which one should I take? This crossing, the relation will be, uh, so, let's see, uh, uh, I want to uh, go this way is the same as going one, two, three, and this becomes the relation. So the first thing is, oh no, 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 I, I wrote it uh, in the not interesting way. I mean, it really doesn't matter, but I, I, I should have started in a, at a different place. So I want to start at the thing that gets cut. So I want to say this way is equal to one, two, three. And here the relation is, uh, let's see, so the first one is C is equal to uh, going this way, which is uh, 
wait, this is C, it's equal to going this way, which is B, uh, and then uh, D, and then uh, B inverse, sorry, and then uh, B inverse, so this is uh, D conjugated by uh, B inverse, and so on, two more relations, okay? Um, so it's actually very easy to compute. Maybe I should I, I should have given it a name. Uh, this is the so-called Wirtinger uh, presentation of uh, the fundamental group of the knot complement. Maybe I'll do another example just for fun and also because there is some moral to it. Uh, so let's do the hop flink. So the hop flink is the simplest two component link there is. Okay, so it's two circles uh, linked. Okay, so uh, the hop flink has uh, two generators because there are only two arcs, one long arc is the first component, the other long arc is the second component. So uh, let's call these generators A and uh, uh, B. And then uh, we have two relations. Uh, so one relation will say that going this way is the same as going one, two, uh, three, and the other one for the other crossing. So the first relation will say that uh, B is equal to, uh, let's see, so going this way is A inverse, so it's A inverse, and then this side is again B. So A inverse B uh, and then A. Uh, and the other relation, you can check that it's the same. Okay? So in fact, we have only one relation. So the group, so pi 1 of the hop flink is uh, the group generated by A and B modulo the relation written here. But this relation, if you multiply by A from the left, becomes AB is equal to BA. So this relation just says AB is equal to BA, and therefore it's the group generated by two commuting generators, so it's really Z squared. Okay? But the moment you see that the group is Z squared, you should be suspicious. Because if the answer, answer is simple, there must have been a simple way to um, find it, to get to it, right? It can't be that it's going to get come out z squared and we are going to need complicated applications of von Kampen's theorem in order to prove it. I mean, maybe it can be, but, uh, you know, you should be suspicious at least. Okay, so you're suspicious, so okay, so if it is z squared, I mean, what could give you z squared without any computation? How would you get z squared without any computation? So what topological space has pi 1 equal to z squared? The torus. The torus, right. So this is also pi 1 of the two-dimensional torus, uh, and you know, if you don't remember what it is, it's just the circle cross the circle, and the picture is this. Okay? But this suggests that the complement of the half link should somehow be um, homotopy equivalent, or maybe even retracts, to the torus, okay? So there should, so the complement seems extremely difficult to visualize, 
right? I mean, I get twisted in knots if I try to visualize the complement, but it should somehow retract to a torus, in a, in a, hopefully in an easy way. So hence, uh, my next riddle to you. So, riddle, uh, show that uh, if you look at S3 and subtract the Hopf-Link, then what you get is homotopy equivalent, and in fact, it, it has a deformation retract to uh, the torus. And not only I want you to show it, I want you to make it to make I, I want you to make me feel idiot that I've asked. I mean it should be so 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 easy. Even though it doesn't look like that. Okay? Okay, questions, comments? Okay. Uh, so um, uh, I the next topic is something that I don't know very well myself. But I want to say a few words about it. So, how strong is pi 1 uh, as, as an invariant? Okay? So, pi 1 is uh, very strong, but... Okay? So, here is the but, first of all. So, let me make a few points. So, point number zero is the but. So, uh, maybe you've heard of the word problem. Okay? So, this is the so-called word problem uh, for uh, groups, and it is insoluble. So, the... the what happened now? Oh no, again I lost my uh, touch. Some, so, sorry, I'm, my, um, my technology is again failing. Okay, is insoluble. So, uh, you can look it up, it's a famous theorem, but in particular it implies that there is no algorithm to tell if two presentations present the same group. It's even worse. There is no algorithm to tell if a presentation presents the trivial group. Okay? So, it's easy to get from K1 into some list of generators modulo some list of relations. So, G1 uh, uh, I modulo relations 1j and it's easy to get from knot number 2 into some list of relation generators g2i modulo g2j sorry uh, relations uh, relations r2j um, but a priori there is no easy way to decide whether two, these two groups are the same. So you've just switched from one thing which is very hard to classify to another one. So what's the point? Okay? There is a point. There will be uh, uses for the fundamental group. Uh, but at least as a tool to... Uh, and you'll see them in fact by the end of this hour, I hope. Uh, but at least as a... As a but it's not obvious that, 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 that it's a tool. It's, it's, it's a much weaker tool than it appears to be. Okay? Because the decision problem is difficult. Uh, now, actually, uh, the, the word problem is for general presentations of groups. So, uh, an ours is not a general presentation. In fact, uh, the Weirtinger presentation is always of the form, I mean, the relations are always of the form one generator is equal, sorry, uh, I had it here, so one generator is equal to another generator conjugated by a third. So these are very, very, very special groups. And in fact, there are other properties that not groups have 
that general groups don't have. So, but, so, so you can say to yourself, uh, well, okay, maybe the word problem in general is insoluble, but the word problem for, um, uh, for knots, for knot groups, could perhaps be soluble. And in fact, it is. But it is in a very, very difficult way in all senses. So it's difficult to prove, it's difficult to explain, and it's difficult to implement, and it's difficult to run. So uh, in practice, it's not a, a good way to separate knots. Okay? Okay, anyway, point number two, uh, sorry, the, the next few points are the points that I, um, I'm kind of, I, I feel I have to show them, I have to, exp to, to, to write them on the board, but I actually don't know how to prove them. So, I mean, I read them in the books, but it's a part of knot theory that I never looked at myself. So I feel uncomfortable. Nevertheless, well, I mean, for general culture, I have to state these things. So I'll state them with a reference. So all of the things that I am about to uh, describe, except one, are in Licorice's book, uh, called Introduction to Knot Theory, and here is what it looks like. So, uh, it's a GTM, uh, what is it, 175, and I'm simply going to quote to you some theorem from, theorems from page 115. Now, the book doesn't actually prove these theorems, the book only refers to other places, but at least all the references are in one place. And I don't have to write all of them. Okay, so uh, the next few points are... Okay, so uh, one... Uh, so this is a theorem of uh, Waldhausen uh, from about 1966 which is actually the year I was born. Uh, so, uh, um, okay, so before that, I have to explain a little more. So, uh, there, is a, there is a little bit more information than just the knot group. So, if you have a knot, uh, then there are two special elements in the knot group and uh, the two special elements are uh, the path that runs parallel to the knot so that's a special element of the knot, of the knot group and let's call it lambda and lambda stands for long t uh, longitude, which really says uh, it goes along the knot. Okay, and then there is a second element which goes around the knot. So you go and you. Uh, I suppose you have to choose an orientation. You go counterclockwise, or uh, you go so that the linking number is one with the knot. So you just make a small loop around the knot, and you call this element mu, and mu stands for meridian. And sorry for mixing Greek and Latin in, in the same word. Okay? Now, both of these elements are in fact uh, conjugacy classes, are not specific elements, because everything depends on the choice of, well, I mean, if the base, but, but, well, it depends on the point, choice of a base point, right? The base point for the Wirtinger presentation was up here, was, you know, sorry, up here near the camera, and, uh, and here I chose a base, well, if the base point is right next to the knot, then it makes sense. Uh, but if you uh, change the base point, these things change by, by conjugation. Okay? 
so, um, um, uh, so, 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 so anyway, the theorem of Waldhausen or the theorem of Waldhausen implies that uh, if you look at the fundamental group of the complement along with the longitude and the meridian, so this, these special elements, then these, then these triples uh, determines uh, the knot. In other words, if you have two such triples and you can find a homomorphism, an isomorphism of one group, so if you have another such triple, uh, pi 1, uh, pi prime, lambda prime, mu prime, and you can find a homomorphism, an isomorphism of pi with pi 1, which maps lambda to lambda prime and mu to mu prime, then the two knots uh, are equal. Okay? Uh, this is, again, I don't know, I mean, even though it's a very old theorem, I think it's still a, it's still a hard one. And I, I don't know how to prove it. Okay, uh, fact two. So, fact two is a theorem of uh, Witten, but not Witten the physicist, but Wilbur Witten, who is a topologist, and, and the, the, the Witten is spelled differently. So, it's Witten and uh, Gonzales. Uh, Akuna, Akuna, uh, I think there is a tilde on the N, and I think it's from around 87, and uh, it says the following, so uh, if the node K is prime, then uh, uh, pi 1 of k uh, determines uh, determines uh, uh, the complement of k determines the complement of k as a manifold So, as a topological space, uh, the fundamental group itself, without the extra information, determines the complement. Now, uh, but I said if a knot is prime, so at some point I hope to go back and uh, say something more about prime knots. For now, I'll just define it. So, a prime knot, so k is prime means k is not a connect sum of two non-trivial knots. So you cannot write k as the connect sum of two uh, non-trivial uh, knots, where both k1 and k2 are non-trivial. Uh, so, in fact, there is a lot to say about prime knot, and this is not so hard, and I hope to say it at some point. Uh, in, there is a, a unique decomposition into primes of knots, and again, this is not so hard, uh, but that, uh, at the moment, I'm just stating uh, the theorem and the definition. And then there is uh, uh, another theorem, so, uh, let's call it Theorem 3, and it's by uh, Gordon and Luke, and it's from 89, I believe, uh, and it says that uh, the uh, complement of an unoriented uh, not uh, determines it. 
So an unoriented knot is simply, well, you know, all our knots so far uh, were oriented. An unoriented knot is if you don't choose an orientation. Or said differently, if you declare that the knot is equivalent to, to its reverse. Okay? You just add another uh, equivalence uh, rule. Okay? And uh, the two theorems together say that a prime knot is determined up to an orientation, up to its, uh, uh, up to its own orientation, by its fundamental group. Okay, so the fundamental group is, is a strong invariant. Okay? Uh, but maybe I should give also a few counterexamples. Okay, first of all, clearly the fundamental group on its own cannot detect orientation, right? Because if the knot is oriented, uh, uh, you know, one way or the other way, the fundamental group clearly can't tell it, right? Because it's the fundamental group of the complement. The complement doesn't see this orientation. Uh, so, uh, 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 and, and maybe I'll give uh, one last and terrible example. Oh, uh, sorry, I should have said one more thing. Uh, this theorem, sorry, the first theorem, that the triple, now I have to wait. Right, so uh, this theorem, the Waldhausen theorem, uh, is also true for links, so also uh, true uh, for links, but where you have a link instead of a single longitude and a single meridian, you have n longitudes and n meridians, okay, where n is the number of components. Uh, though I have to say that I failed to find a reference uh, in the hour or so that I was searching for it, so I know it's true, uh, but I, I couldn't find a, a authoritative reference. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the last thing I wanted to do uh, before switching topics a little bit is uh, to show you uh, the follow the the the. I, I really don't know what makes some days good and some days bad in terms of uh, uh, um, responsiveness. Okay, anyway, I wanted to show this example. So, uh, claim... So, these are two different links, so let's call them L1 and L2. So, the claim is L1 is not equal to L2. This is easy to show. Uh, why is it true? Why is it obvious? Linking numbers, the linking numbers of the various components. Are right. So the linking numbers of orange and green, the linking number of orange and green are, is plus or minus one here. I don't know if it's plus or minus one because I, the, the components were not even oriented, right? But, but it's definitely zero over here. Okay, so L1 is clearly not equal to L2, uh, yet uh, L1 complement is homeomorphic to L2 complement as a manifold. Okay? And the links don't just differ by reversing an orientation of, or by reverse, the re reversing an orientation of a, a strand, and they're also not a, they're also prime. There is no way to decompose them. Actually, this one may, maybe can be decomposed, but this one is prime. So, uh, so why are the complements homeomorphic? So, 
So, um, uh, it's actually not that hard, and it's kind of fun. Uh, but, but anyway, sorry, in particular this means that the fundamental group of the complements, the fundamental groups of the complements are going to be the same, right? So, uh, the fundamental group is definitely going to fail separating these, uh, unless you add the meridians and longitudes. Um, so, um, let me try to explain uh, why their complements are homeomorphic. So let me describe... Wait, does this have to do with... Oh, sorry. Let, let, me, let me describe the homeomorphism between their complements. Okay? So, uh, think about... Do I have enough space? You know what? Um, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, 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 test my luck and try to copy-paste it to a place where uh, where I'll have more space. So, uh, forgive me. Uh, I don't have my keyboard. Okay, so now let's go down. Okay, and uh, everything is so, you know, I maybe I should reboot my computer for next time and, uh, and, oh no, what happened? I didn't copy. Ugh. Sorry. Uh. Okay, let's try again. I really don't know why um, things are so fragile today. Okay. Uh, okay, so... Um, ah, what happened now? I don't know. Anyway, so... Um, Okay, so think about the complement of the blue component. Basically, I'm, I'm, I'm not going... So, so think about the complement of the blue component. The complement of the blue component looks like... Um, well, I guess uh, here is the blue component. And its complement looks like... Uh, sort of, uh, or, or at least a part of the complement looks like uh, more or less like the picture I'm now drawing. Okay, so I made the blue component a bit thicker, and in fact it is thick in the picture, and then the, the complement, which is in green, looks like maybe an hourglass or something like that. Now, cut this hourglass uh, in the plane of the blue component. So, it will become a pair of uh, funnel shapes. So, one funnel shape. And down below it, uh, another funnel shape.
and now, um, I mean, this funnel shape is in fact topologically just a tube. So take this tube and um, um, and um, spin it around itself 360 degrees. So uh, take this, uh, basically take the bottom of the top pan uh, funnel and rotate it by 360 degrees. Uh, this will mean, for example, that every curve on the funnel that goes from the uh, top to the bottom instead will make a full circle before getting to the bottom. Okay? And then glue it again. And when you glue it again, uh, so, so that defines a, a, well, that defines a map from the funnel to itself, right? Because when you glue it again, since I've rotated by exactly 360 degrees, um, every point gets glued to where it was before. However, curves that went through the funnel get twisted by 300 and get twisted around. Okay? Uh, so, it's a homeomorphism of the complement of the blue component to itself, and it carries, well, basically, if you, uh, uh, if you pass two parallel lines through the funnel, then after this 360 degrees uh, twist, they will become, uh, so two parallel lines will become two uh, twisted parallel lines. Okay? And that's exactly what takes L2 to L1. The, the only difference is that instead of green and, uh, and orange being parallel as they pass through blue, uh, they become twisted. Okay? So the homeomorphism of the complement of blue to itself that I've just described takes uh, orange and green from L, from the L1 configuration to the L2 configuration, and therefore it takes the complement of orange and green to the complement of the orange and, or orange and green, uh, I mean, from the complement here to the complement here. So, in fact, uh, the two not complements here, link complements here, are homeomorphic. Okay. And uh, so, you know, I'll say... Uh, we're out of time, but I do want to say, uh, 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 you know, a point, maybe point number uh, uh, five, okay? So I a little bit discounted the value of the fundamental group because I told you you cannot compute it. But that doesn't make it useless because you can do the following. So you can pick a group G, so pick some... Uh, other, in fact, finite, if you wish, group uh, G. I mean, if you want, you can just pick it to be uh, like the symmetric group on five elements. Or maybe the dihedral group on six element elements. Or, you know, just some, one of the standard uh, finite group G. And uh, you can then compare you can then look for representations from pi 1 of the knot complement, so from, from pi 1 of the knot, into uh, this finite group G. There are, or in other words, just homeomorphisms from, just homomorphisms from pi 1 of K to G. Now, this is a finite set. And it's a finite set that, in principle, easy to determine algorithmically. All you have to do is to decide where to map all of the generators here and verify that they satisfy the relations. 
Okay, so in principle, this is an easy set to determine, and then you can count uh, this, you can count these representations, and this is a not invariant. And this one is easy to compute. Okay, and in fact, if you think about it, it's a coloring invariant. Really, you're coloring the arcs of the knot by the elements of the target group G. And if I had another 10 minutes, I would have shown you that if you do it for D6, you get the three coloring invariants that we were talking about long ago, uh, but uh, I suppose this will happen after the break. So, uh, yeah, I'll stop now. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties today, and I should add that next week there are no classes. So the next class is Monday, a week from the coming Monday. Okay? Uh, good. Questions, comments? Uh, yeah, so really the, the, the fundamental group is not a complete invariant. It's nearly a complete invariant. Right, so I've shown, I've sh uh, or if you read the theorems that I've quoted, if you add a little bit to it, so the longitude and the meridian, it becomes a complete invariant. Because of what you, sh uh, the, the, the two rings you showed up. Right. Um, if you add the longitude and the, comp uh, and the meridian to the, uh, to the example I was showing, then... Uh, then the two things become different, right? So uh, the meridian of the blue component gets completely twisted around uh, by this uh, homomorphism, homeomorphism. So, uh, so the fundamental group of these two links is the same. The two fundament the fundamental groups of these two links are the same, but the the fundamental groups, along with the extra information, the meridians and longitudes, are not the same. So, so the fundamental group is a very strong invariant, but, uh, again, but in itself, it's very hard to work with. I had another uh, question. Yeah. So, since we know that unoriented knots are determined by their complements, and now we have what seems like a very general procedure to get uh, homeomorphic complements for different unoriented links by just adding a date twist in multiple ways. Yeah. Along, you take any knot and you slice out that knot in the link, and you take a plane slicing that knot, and you do a similar thing here. So, this seems like a very general procedure. Is this the only way you can get different complements for? Uh, uh, so did you get this, uh, homomorphic complements for different unoriented links? I don't know. I, I told you. I mean, this is like this chapter is kind of outside of my uh, right, right. my comfort zone. Okay, uh, let's quit. Again, sorry for all the technical difficulties today.